All right, Shannon Bream, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast on this very momentous day. Um, and it is so monumental on so many different angles. And it's almost hard to say, where do we start? But I think mm-hmm. we have to start. And I'd love to start with you, Shannon, on simply the unprecedented nature of how this news item made its way to the news cycle. The fact that this was apparently leaked to Politico. We don't yet know the details of how or who might have leaked this. But talk to me about how unprecedented it is for us to know a draft opinion before it's published Mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. It's actually shocking. Um, I've covered the court for 15 years, and the court has gone on for centuries before that. But this is exceptionally rare that something like this would happen. Now, over the weekend, I started to hear, um, I got a tip that something would be coming from Politico regarding the Supreme Court. Never in my wildest imagination did I think it would be a leaked draft opinion, which the court has now confirmed is the real deal. Um, I think it's it's just something that's beyond anything we would ever expect. And uh, it, it gives people a little bit of an insight into how this whole thing works. I mean, what we eventually get for the final opinion may be nothing like or exactly like what Justice Alito wrote in that draft. We'll just have to wait and see. And who votes for it? And how does something like this happen, Shannon? Who would have access to a draft opinion? How would they get it out of the building? I'm not sure. Is Mm -hmm. it as easy as simply emailing it to somebody? But who could do this and how would they do it? There's a very, very small universe of people who would have access. So, of course, clerks. Every justice has four clerks. Uh, The justices themselves, which I would not believe in my um, craziest imaginations that any of them would have had anything to do with this. Um, But there are other court personnel who are around. Um, The chief justice gave a very full-throated defense of them, saying, we trust these people. These are public servants. But clearly, there's been one singular egregious violation of all of the um, um, sacrosanct policies that we hold here and what we believe about this court and protecting it. So um, listen, a lot of times these opinions over the years have been done. Some justices will write them in longhand. Some of them will only handle hard copies. Um, It's not common to my understanding that they would actually circulate these particular types of opinions in email. So it would have to be somebody who probably could get their hands on a hard copy. Um, And that, that eliminates a lot of people, which makes it a very tiny group. Who does that eliminate? I heard the three groups. The three groups, I think, are the justices themselves, Mm -hmm. the clerks. And I've heard you say on television, each justice has, I believe, four clerks. Yeah. So that Mm -hmm. puts us as 36 potential clerks and then some permanent support staff around the Supreme Court. So then who can we eliminate in your estimation? What I would say for eliminating is so far we haven't heard anything about this being potentially a hack, like a group or somebody from outside the court actually somehow got their hands on this by infiltrating the court's computer system. Like I said, my understanding has been that most of these, this level of opinion is generally circulated by hard copy. Um, I don't know that that's 100% of the time, but I would imagine this would be one of those opinions that would be. Uh, done that way. So you kind of think, all right, if it's not in the computer system, not saying there's no chance it is, it probably wasn't, then we're probably not looking at somebody who is an outside actor hacking into that system. So again, that leaves us with, you know, people who work at the court or clerk at the court. And um, I I think as the Chief Justice has said, investigations underway, the U.S. Marshal's Office, which is tasked with protecting federal judiciary members and buildings, is on it. And I think he's going to be very determined to get to the bottom of this. Okay. I think you and I would both acknowledge and we need to acknowledge that we can't know what we don't know so this will be Mm -hmm. this will be um speculation but you said in your wildest dreams you cannot imagine one of the justices releasing this and i think of course when it comes to the justices if we were just sort of playing the mind games you'd say well maybe one of the liberal justices who would oppose this opinion a la sotomayor or maybe even the chief justice himself john roberts who's attempting to keep I don't know, norms and decorum and order and status quo as best as possible. But outside of the justices, I think most people, Shannon, are looking at the clerks because Mm -hmm. the permanent support staff around the court has never done anything like this. It's so unprecedented. Why now? And the clerks give us more insight into that. Like they rotate on Mm -hmm. what kind of cycle. And, And while you're answering that, I also want to share this with you. I did see a tweet. It was anonymous. It was from a Yale, supposedly from a Yale law professor who said, the kind of graduates that we have been graduating recently, he would not or she would not be surprised at something like this because mm-hmm. the recent law school graduates believe in advocacy and would believe mm-hmm. in accomplishing advocacy over preserving the norms of the court. Mm-hmm. 
Well, listen, you can't rule anything out at this point. Everybody's going to be a suspect who has had hands to touch that thing. Um, so what happens is each year the justices interview and select four clerks to be with them for a year. And it is the toughest job you will ever try to get as a law school graduate. You could be number one in your class at Yale and you are still fighting against everybody else for a position at the Supreme Court. You are set for life in your legal career if you have clerked at the highest court, which is why I'm puzzled that any clerk would take this chance. It is career suicide. Now, if you're not going to be uh, a traditional lawyer for the rest of your life, because you're probably going to get disbarred if, if indeed it was a clerk and you get caught, not only going to get fired, you'll probably lose your license. Um, I can't imagine they would want to blow up their careers in that way unless they do have a different plan. They want to be an advocate. They want to write a book, something like that. But I got to tell you, you know, I've had people float to me, too. What if it was someone on the right? What if this is the opinion the conservatives wanted out there? They wanted to release it and say, this is our reasoning, afraid that maybe the chief justice um, felt differently and was going to, to try to mm. water down the opinion or join them and make changes that they didn't like. I mean, all of this is just wild speculation at this point. But I think we have to say, let's have an open mind because this investigation investigation could lead you anywhere. Okay, that, that's fascinating. I just want to peel back that onion on that for a moment. If it, let's, for the sake of argument, say, if it were Sotomayor or Kagan, we could understand. They're morally opposed to the potential decision ramifications, so get it out there. If it were the Chief Justice, it could go through the rationale, which I was laying out just a moment ago, but mm -hmm. you're saying there's also, in playing the sort of game theory of this, you could yeah. say it's some of those on the right, like the Alitos or the Thomases, under the rationale that Four are in. The chief justice may join the opinion. And then as the chief justice, he can assign the opinion to himself and water down the 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 language in the opinion, water down the ultimate ruling. So that would be what he could do, mm -hmm. motivating a justice on the right to put this out to avoid that scenario. Yeah, I mean, that could, I, again, um, it, everything in our brains are exploding because it's crazy right. to consider any of these scenarios. But yeah, if there was a member, and listen, that opinion, that draft opinion, which the court again has said is legitimate, was titled opinion of the court, meaning it had at least five votes when it was put together. So there were right. five votes for what Alito was doing. If there was some worry among one of those five that they weren't going to get that full-throated takedown of Roe, but that's what they wanted, it's possible that's why this thing leaked out from a clerk on that side or from somebody on that side of this argument. Um, it's, you know, possible. I think when we yeah, I mean, when we find out one day, um, all we can do at this point is just sort of speculate. And, and you can't just tag one side or the other. I think you have to look at everybody and say, all right, let's be fair here and go down the wildest rabbit trails and see who could have possibly had what motivation to do this as any good investigation would. Now, l let's let's play this out as well, which will still be speculation. What would, in order to figure out what the motivation would be in something like this, Shannon, what do you think is a realistic repercussion of this opinion being leaked? Do you think the Supreme Court's resolve will be will be bolstered by this getting out in the public? Or, or do you think the Supreme Court is going to sit here with their finger up in the air, monitoring the public going, I don't know, I mean, I wonder, is the Supreme Court malleable to the response this leak will have out in the public? I don't think so. And it's interesting because in this draft opinion, Justice Alito, and again, I can't wait till we get the final because I'm going to go page by page to see how much it does or changed. doesn't mirror this draft, yeah. see what happened and see if votes changed or if anything else changed. Um, but he says in here, listen, it's not our job as the court to worry about what the public response will be to what we decide if our job as jurists is to interpret the law and apply it to the facts. I mean, that's it. It's not our job to worry about what the public outcry is after we make a decision. Um, the Chief Justice has been very, very vocal about the fact that he is is um, very protective of the court as an institution. He does not want it to be viewed as political, which some of his critics will say in an attempt to avoid that, he has at times made it look political and they point to the decision on the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, you're going to have critics no matter what you do. But I think it's impressive today that the chief has said this is not going to be whatever the whatever the underlying motivation was for this. It's not going to disrupt our work. We've got an investigation and we're going to keep doing what we do. Hey, Shannon, can we make assumptions? You said because it is entitled the opinion of the court, there are mm -hmm. at least five justices. At who the time have, it was written. Yep. At the time it was written, at least five justices. Can we make pretty reasonable assumptions about who those five justices might be that co-sign or sign up with Alito's opinion? If I had to guess, obviously, you've got Justice Alito. I would throw in Thomas Gorsuch. Kavanaugh and Barrett. I would not personally throw uh, the chief justice into if, it were, if we're looking at five. Who knows? Maybe it was six. Um, if, if we're going to go with five, I would 
I would carve out the chief only because I think that he would be a vote to uphold that Mississippi law. I think most of us came out of that oral argument and thought there are five, maybe six votes to uphold the Mississippi law, where I think the hesitation would be probably for the chief. And again, just educated guesses here. Right. Um, I don't think he'd want to go all the way with disrupting Roe and overturning Roe. But there were at least five people willing to do right. that at the time that Justice Alito wrote that draft. And the one name you didn't mention was Justice Thomas. So Justice Kavanaugh, Justice oh, sorry, Alito, yes. Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Barrett are reasonable expectations for the five that would mm-hmm. sign on to that opinion. And so back to the mechanics for one second, Shannon, because all of a sudden I find this theory fascinating not probable but possible to your point if justice roberts chief justice roberts joined the five if he chose to between now and when it is published joined the five and made it a six to three decision presumably a six to three decision he could then take over the opinion though right he could assign it to himself and write the opinion Mm -hmm. making what we just read not moot in the outcome the outcome would be the same but the perhaps weight and expanse of the decision could be reined in, watered down, whatever we want to say, by Roberts writing mm-hmm. the opinion himself if he joins the majority. Yeah, and again, I think he's probably a vote to uphold that Mississippi law, just an educated guess. But my gut tells me he would not probably be a full-throated vote for overturning Roe. So, yeah, if he if he took over the opinion as had been written, for whoever the five, at least the five who were on board, um, certainly he would have much more say in exactly what happened. Now, um, whether those five would stick together and say, no, you go write your own concurrence. And your concurrence can be like, OK, I'm going to uphold the Mississippi law, but I'm not going there with these five on row. Right. Um, but you got to just consider every possibility. <laughs> um, I'm glad to talk to you again. You know what? I would love to pick up with you right where I unfortunately had to leave off with Shannon Bream. And I was in the midst. Right. I was about to ask Shannon Bream this question, Andy, and you're the perfect person to answer it. Let's walk through and it is speculation, but let's walk through the potentiality of who leaked this draft opinion by Justice Samuel Alito. I want to know what's the fallout. What's the repercussions? If it's a clerk, is it disbarment? Is it potentially criminal charges? Andy, what if it's a justice? What is the fallout? Well, to begin with, Will, I would be investigating it as a criminal investigation, and I would get on it right away because leak investigations do not get better with time. Uh, You need to get on them because the more diffuse information gets, it's not that it changes your, your core suspicions like the core group of people who had access to this information at the time of the leak but the more time goes by the more noise there is and the more difficult it becomes to investigate but i do think that there are plenty of criminal bases to investigate this it's an obstruction of justice in the case uh you have to remember that all of the people who are involved the justices their clerks the staff that supports the court They're government employees. When the justices um, swap opinions around from from chambers to chambers, that's not their personal property. That belongs to the United States. These are government records. Um, Federal law says that if you embezzle a government record or if you otherwise convert it to your own use, that can be prosecuted as a felony. The other thing I would be mindful of is there is a crime called conspiracy to defraud the United States. Now, when you hear that term, like when I hear that term, I think defraud, it means you're it's a pecuniary thing, right? You're stealing right. money or property from someone. But the way the Supreme Court since the early 20th century has interpreted that statute, basically they can reach anything that is a deceptive practice that undermines government operations. So – If you use your government access to get access to Justice Alito's opinion, you convert it to your own use and then you put it out there, particularly if you put it out there for the obvious purpose of intimidating the justices, that's obviously grist for a criminal investigation. So I always start because you have to start at the beginning with the possibility of criminal indictment and then If, as you investigate, it turns out that the case isn't there, then you can deal with that. That's actually a welcome development. But if you don't investigate it now, if you don't get on top of it now, you probably lose a lot of good evidence. And so if I'm listening to you correctly, as a former federal prosecutor, you're investigating it with these charges potentially in mind. Um, Federal embezzlement, one. 
to conspiracy to defraud the United States government, those two charges as the basis for a potential investigation? I also think obstruction of justice in the Dobbs case, because obviously what this is, is a corrupt act that was done for purposes of trying to influence the process, influence the judicial proceeding. So I think it's also potentially an obstruction of justice. Three potential charges. Now, let's play the most extreme scenario out for one moment. Not the most likely, but the most extreme. What if it were one of the justices? And by the way, I just had a fascinating conversation with Shannon Bream. We have to leave all possibilities open, as every appropriate investigator would. You don't exclusively assume it's Sotomayor or Kagan or anybody on the left. It could be anyone. It could be theoretically a justice on the right who wants to influence the potential outcome. The point isn't probability. It's, again, just possibility. So what if, Andy, it turns out this was leaked directly from a justice? Would all of these same criminal charges apply? They would apply. Now, it could complicate the investigation because justices, at least among themselves, would have more discretion to disseminate things than you would presume their staffers and other people who support the court. But – the, the court will has regular processes for disseminating information. And if those processes aren't followed, that means whoever disseminated it, whether it's a justice or somebody else, converted a government record to his or her own use uh, and put it out to somebody who wasn't authorized to have it at this point, uh, which to me would be an embezzlement. Um I don't think it was a justice. I'd be very surprised that now, as as you point out, you have to identify everybody who conceivably had access to it, whether you think it's probable or not. And that goes from, you know, everybody from Chief Justice Roberts down to whoever the court is using to print documents. Right. You know, it may not, it may not even be for all we know, uh, you know, somebody who's in the chain of justice to clerk to uh, support personnel. It could be, you know, they have contractors who print stuff. So anyone who had access to it, obviously, is somebody who's within the circle of people who could have disseminated it. And then to narrow the field, I mean, you want to talk to everyone, but obviously you start thinking about who had the motive. You try to figure out, you know, how did it get from A to B to C and then try to narrow the circle that way. So let's fall short of criminal charges and walk up the ladder. Tell me if you think you agree and where you would fill in the gaps here. If it's a permanent courthouse, Supreme Court employee, clearly short of criminal charges, they lose their job. If it is a clerk, I've heard people say your legal career is done. You will be disbarred. You will never be a practicing attorney. And I want to put that to you in just one moment. But also I want to ask you this. So again, in the extreme presumption that it's a justice, what does that mean for that justice short of criminal charges In other words, these lifetime appointments, they're not insulated from everything, right, Andy? I mean, is there a process? Were it, if an investigation came back and said it was connected to one of the justices, is that grounds for, I don't know, what, impeachment, removal, what? It is grounds for impeachment under the Constitution. There is a... There are a handful of justices in American history who have been impeached. There's actually some fairly important... uh, impeachment cases will that involve justices because it goes to the grounds under which you can or for which you can impeach a justice. So there's an early impeachment case involving uh, a I believe it was a justice of the Supreme Court um, where uh, there was some debate about whether you could uh, impeach somebody over incompetence or it had to be some kind of corrupt act. And the uh, the message taken out of the case, which has been applied as if it were a precedent ever since, is it needs to be a corrupt act that we don't that we don't impeach anyone over incompetence. I'm not sure that's right, by the way, but that's that's the tradition we've grown up with uh, for centuries. But, yes, they are liable to impeachment. And this would fall under the umbrella of a corruption or a corrupt act anyway. So that precedent, as you point out, seemingly would apply to a justice. Um, All right. I want to start talking to you. Well, let me ask you one more question about the fallout from the leak before I turn to the legal precedent of this opinion by Justice Alito and its effect on Roe. One more question on the leak. 
What do you think this does, Andy, to the institution of the Supreme Court of the United States? Either way, if if nothing happens in the opinion that's issued and published in due time is exactly what we've already read, there's going to be loss of trust on the bench, within the room, within the hallways. But if the opinion changes now because it's been leaked, that's a whole other level of loss of trust in the institution. What does this do to the Supreme Court? I think, Will, it depends on how it's handled. So if nothing happens, or even worse, if it looks like the only people who are upset about this are the chief justice and the five justices who are on Justice Alito's draft opinion, then I think that's very problematic because this is one of these things where I think the court needs to speak with one voice because – it's as much in the interest, it should be at least, of the progressive justices as the conservative justices and those who are uh, in between that the court's integrity, the integrity of the court's processes and the court's viability as an institution be preserved. And the only way that you can do that is make sure that their deliberations are confidential. Think for a second, Will, of what would happen, what chaos would happen in the criminal justice system if we now waive the rule that when juries deliberate on cases, they don't need to be they don't need to keep their deliberations confidential anymore. They can go home and talk to mom and dad, read the newspaper, uh, gauge public opinion, listen to, uh, you know, talk radio, read the papers uh, and bring all that to the jury room the next day. That would destroy the integrity of the American trial. And this is just another judicial proceeding that's on a different level. This is an appellate court, not a trial court. But the need to have deliberations that have integrity is exactly the same. And if if that trust that the justices have for their collegial process, if that's lost, the court doesn't exist as the institution we've known for centuries. No, it's just another institution in our republic that is now at the whim of the mob. And not to overstate that, but in my estimation, Andy, that's what's going on. The leaker is trying to marshal the mob to influence the court. And we've already seen the power of the mob in American culture when it comes to corporate decisions, when it comes to the political process, when it comes to everything. The court is supposed to be – and look – You and I both know juries do turn on the radio. They do discuss it with their family. But we at least have to try to preserve the integrity that's an insulated process from mob justice. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, you know, look, they have to be able to speak to each other. That is their process. I mean, the way that we get rulings, authoritative rulings from the court is they swap these opinions. And sometimes it changes minds. Sometimes it moves votes. But the the only way it works and the only way that you preserve the dynamic that you have is if it's confidential. Mm. And what I worry about and, and what I think is so transparent about and transparent in a bad way about all of this is what's the first thing you hear? We need to go to court packing. You know, the first time people are upset by a draft opinion, they say, you know, now we need to pack the court, put more members on it. If you pack the court, You do exactly what we've been talking about, which is change that institution. It's no longer a judicial institution, then it's a super legislature. Because if what you're saying is this is all outcome determinative, it has nothing to do with the law, it has nothing to do with due process, it's we want our outcome. And if you don't give us our outcome, we're going to put some judges on the bench who will. Then it's a legislature. Then it's a political body. It's not it's not governed by the rule of law anymore. It's outcome determinative. I want to come back to that in a moment. So here are the three places I want to go with you now on on legal analysis. First, help me lay out for the audience, Andy, if this opinion is what is published, what happens? I think there are many people today pro or con abortion who all of a sudden think, well, now abortion is illegal. That is not the case. It just returns this to the democratic process and to the states. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it basically moves us back to where we were in 1973, at which point, as Justice Alito's draft opinion lays out, there were about 30 states in the United States where abortion was illegal, and there were about 20 states where it was legal to one extent or another. And if the court had stayed out of it, Will, and just allowed democracy to work, 
then what you would probably have at this point is two things which would have been beneficial to the country. One is you would have different states would have different regimes of abortion, and nobody would think that that was a big deal because we do that with a lot of things in a federalist structure. So that would be number one. You would have some states that had very restrictive abortion rules. You'd have some that had lax, and you'd probably have a lot in the middle that had you know marginal differences in how they – regulated it. The other good thing that would have happened was our judicial confirmation process and our politics along with it would not have corroded the way that right. it did, would not have been corrupted the way it did. This all happened because rather than trusting democracy, and this is what drives me nuts about progressives when they talk about this, all they talk about is democracy until it happens. And then right. what, what ends up happening is they want an outcome. And if you won't vote the outcome that they want, they got other outcomes and they got judges who are willing to uh, impose the outcome as edicts. So I'd like to hear a lot less talk about democracy and a lot more democracy. Yeah. Now, the argument of the pro-abortion lobby would be this is not a right that should be subject to democracy. So the argument would go, Andy, that and you and I would agree there are certain rights that are not up to the right. popular vote of the majority. You can't vote popularly to reinstitute slavery that is protected against by the United States Constitution. Now, those in the pro-abortion stance would like to say that as well is a right protected in the Constitution and not subject to a Democratic majority. Now, the rationale, which has changed over time, but the rationale starting with Roe v. Wade, I'd love to walk through with you. And that is, to my understanding, starting with Roe, this invisible definition of a right to personal privacy embedded in three or four different amendments to the United States Constitution. That evolved with Casey versus Planned Parenthood. It evolved over time. But the truth is, Andy, it really has, from both the left and the right, been acknowledged as one of the weakest Supreme Court decisions on a sheer logic and legal and constitutional basis, one of the weakest in history. Yes, because it's completely unmoored from the text. And as Justice Alito's draft opinion explains, if you're going to derive what we're talking about here, Will, are unenumerated rights. And what I mean by that is let's let's distinguish them from what I think you were talking about, which is the rights that are stated in, in the Bill of Rights. I mean, the whole reason for having a constitution or one of the big reasons for having a constitution is to protect minority rights. So no matter what democracy does, they can't take away your First Amendment. They can't right. take away your Fourth Amendment uh, privacy protection. Then there is the part of the Constitution that says the fact that we don't enumerate rights here doesn't mean they're not rights. And some of those the court has deemed to be fundamental enough to have constitutional protection. But the category of those rights is they have to be basically foundational in our tradition – and they have to be essential to a system of ordered liberty. And you simply cannot say that about abortion, which was uh, illegal in most of the country at the time of the founding, was illegal in three quarters of the states at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted. And even after Roe has been the subject of tremendous debate and division in the country, it's simply – I mean you could say it's a good thing to have. You could say – it's not a good thing to have. What you can't say is it's part of the American tradition. It never has been. Right. So this idea of a penumbra of privacy rights embedded in the combination of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, 14th is one way this right to privacy was created. But you're pointing out substantive due process, I believe, the 14th Amendment, where they say, well, there are rights that are unenumerated. But to your point, Alito says, yes, but those must be grounded in some American tradition, which abortion simply right. is not. So there is no – the end result being there is no constitutional right to privacy. Now, I want to ask you this, um, and this would, I think, be the chief – Justice John Roberts' rationale, and that is caution, 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 stare decisis, settled law. The idea being, well, we've been doing this for 50 years, and this is baked into, I don't know, the way things are done in the United States of America. It's this extreme deference for precedent for what came before you. I don't know what the Chief Justice will or would write, but I know that he is definitely a devotee of precedent, of quote-unquote settled law. What do you say to anyone who would say, well, regardless of what 
your rationale may be, this has been the law of the land for 50 years, and you can't just go around jerking out the law of the land. Yeah, but it hasn't, Will, right? I mean, you know, let's let's think about that for a second, right? First of all, we all know that cases could be reversed, right? Dred Scott would be still the law, and Plessy versus Ferguson would still be the yes. law if you couldn't reverse something just because it was precedent, okay? Now let's talk about Roe. I have a news flash for people because you would never know this from reading the press. Roe has not been the law of the United States since 1982. Um, once Casey came along, it completely under it kept the, the basic ruling of Roe, but it totally undermined the rationale of Roe. So that lasted from like for like nine years, which, right. you know, is 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 a flash of, uh, of time. Um, and what is Casey about? Casey is exactly about a dynamic for trying to figure out how you regulate abortion. It doesn't say anyone who wants an abortion can get an abortion. It says we have a competing interest of the state. We have the, the life and, and health and privacy of the woman, and we have the state's interest in fetal life, human life. Uh, and those interests have to be, they are intention in these cases, and they have to be weighed. And what we have had since 1982 is a regime for trying to balance out those interests. So there's no right. settled doctrine about like when you are able to have an abortion. And what has occurred over time is as technology has changed and as the court's jurisprudence, frankly, has changed and gotten more, I think, sane as far as uh, devotion to the text and to the original understanding of the Constitution – the Casey rationale proves to be no more sustainable than the Roe rationale that it overhauled. So the idea that you're hearing today that we have this settled abortion jurisprudence and the, and the court has suddenly abruptly thrown it out is nonsense. What Casey is all about is how you weigh this tension. And that's right. the reason we've had a million cases since, since Casey, which have come out on different sides of the equation. I'm so glad you brought up Dred Scott. You could have mentioned Korematsu, bad right. Supreme Court decisions that we don't simply go, well, it's too bad. They've decided it so poorly, but law of the land, we have to follow. And to your point, Plessy versus Ferguson, which established separate but equal, was settled law for six decades. For right. 60 years, it was the law of the land. And that did not stop the Supreme Court from righteously saying, this isn't right. And adopting Brown versus Board of Education. So we can't just follow an incorrect decision into eternity. And this will bring us full circle. That competing interest of Casey you described, what has that done? It's done exactly what you described. It turned the court into a super legislative process. And all we're saying now is returning this to the actual legislature, to the people yeah, that's to decide democratically. That's right. And, and Will, what you're hitting on, I think, is the fundamental difference between progressive judges – and constitutional conservatives. Progressive judges have no hesitation about imposing outcomes on the public and removing issues from the democratic process. But what you notice here is that the conservative justices, if this case comes out as Alito's opinion indicates, they're not saying you will not have abortion. What they're saying is we're returning this, we're, we're acting as we're supposed to act as a judicial institution, which is we are modest. We stand back and let democracy happen unless there's some command of the Constitution that requires us to intervene. So they're not telling you what to do with abortion. What they're saying is democratic self-determinism, which is what the, the progressives always tell us they're all about. Well, you get to have it now. You get to decide how you're going to run your life and you get to decide things like abortion. Andy, it's been too long since I've seen you in person. I really appreciate you jumping on on this very important day to help shed some light. Thanks, man. That, thanks so much, Will. Great to see you. You too. Listen, I wanted to talk to you today. I was excited to talk to you. Um, I am in this episode of the Will Kane podcast talking to many people. I'm talking to Shannon Bream about the tactics of leaking a Supreme Court opinion and the impact that has on the legitimacy of the court. I'm talking to Andy McCarthy about the law of the presumed and invisible right to privacy and what this means literally to overturn Roe. But I wanted to talk to you, Ben, specifically 
at a little more esoteric level, I wanted to talk to you about the morality, the philosophical implications of abortion. I know this is something near and dear to your heart, not just from any personal relationship that we have, but honestly, man, I watched you when you were guest hosting the 7 p.m. show on the Fox News channel, which was then entitled Primetime, and it's now Jesse Waters Primetime. And I saw your very emotional monologue about protecting the unborn. Tell me your emotional connection to this very important and moral issue. Well, look, uh, Will, I think, uh, and I appreciate you having me uh, uh, join you. I, I think that this is, you know, at its core, the most fundamental issue about what we are as a country. Um, and, you know, I think I, I don't like to draw comparisons to the past, but I truly do believe that this is the modern equivalent of the abolitionist movement that we saw in the, the mid of the 19th century and, uh, and the 1850s, people who stood up and asserted that, you know, regardless of what you thought about anything that was around you, uh, that the people who were enslaved deserved to have human rights just as much as anyone who happened to be walking around. And I think that when it comes to the abortion issue, unfortunately, you know, we have for the last 50 years endured a regime that really uh, was designed to gaslight the country, to pretend that science didn't exist, to pretend that we didn't know more and more about the way that human fetuses are formed within the womb, uh, to pretend that they can't feel pain, they can't recognize voices, they can't, you know, recognize what is going on around them. And as anyone who has a child knows, as I know you know, as I know so many of our colleagues know, the, the truth is that once you've gone through the process of pregnancy, or even if you've gone through the process of miscarriage, which sadly affects a lot more Americans than I think we know, uh, this is something that changes you. It makes it clear to you that this is a person with a personality. And, you know, the truth is that we've had a regime here in America that wanted to deny that, that wanted to pretend like, you know, this was someone who could be discarded um, and, you know, irrelevant or, you know, inconvenient human being that we could just toss to the side. And we've all known, I think, deep in our hearts that this was not the case. But there has been a whole regime, the media, our corporate environments, our, you know, leftist sort of dominated uh, cultural realities that pretends that this is not the case. Look, Will, mm -hmm. as you know, I'm married to Megan McCain. And when she was on ABC's The View, she was the only woman, the only pro-life woman on any of the major networks other than Fox. Think wow. about that for a second. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just, it's, it's unfathomable. You know, the, the idea that you would pretend like pro-life women just don't exist, but that is really a demonstration of the weakness of this regime because they so, have to maintain that fiction. So, you know, Ben, I want to talk to you about sort of the logic of the philosophy of when life begins, but I don't, I don't want to go there yet. I want to stay on sort of this. I think it's okay to describe it as emotional connection to the morality of when life begins. I saw a stat today, and I don't know if it's real, Ben, or not, but I think the stat was one of the most pro-choice demographics in the United States is young men. I don't know if that's true, but it sounds like it could be true to me. It is. And, it, 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 and, it is, and, and there's been consistent polling on that, yeah. Okay, and, and I think that we can make some pretty callous observations about why that may be. But the reason I point that out is to your point of the life-changing event, it is of becoming a father, of having a child. And it is almost impossible to describe if you do not or have not experienced that pleasure in life, that joy in life. And... I wonder, Ben, 
it's an almost inseparable, not almost, I think it probably is to some extent inseparable from a belief in a higher being. Um, but take this broader, like you look at, you look at um, civilizations throughout human history, Spartans supposedly throwing defective, quote, quote, unquote, defective babies off the top of the mountain because they couldn't become great Spartan warriors. What is it? When, when do you think we arrive morally at the point where we recognize a human being before we can see it, when we recognize a human being when it's still in gestation? Like, walk me through this moral calculus. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that one of the things that, that happens is, you know, we, we're forced to move on from our natural selfish natures, uh, which I think are things that, you know, come into our lives when we are children, um, you know, the people who don't share well and the like. Uh, but one thing that I think is, is certainly uh, true of a lot of people who've gone through the experience of either having a child or having a child and losing it, um, is that you, you come to understand that you have a responsibility to others in this universe. Um, and that that's something that, you know, overwhelms all of the things that are around you. You know, yeah. I've heard various people describe it as the equivalent of, uh, the moment in the wizard of Oz, where you go from being black and white to being in color, it changes the reality. Um, it changes what your priorities are. Suddenly, uh, you come to respect everything that's come before and you come to understand, oh, this is why my parents were this way. <laughs> this is, this is why, you know, other parents are that way. Uh, because you start to understand the obligations that are put upon you. But that responsibility, I think, is something that our modern age has been very willing to shirk. You know, we, we want to run away from it. And that's something that I think abortion was designed to fuel. It was designed to fuel the idea that, you know, the inconvenient life was one that you could discard and that you could do it without any kind of, of moral ambiguity. You could feel good about it. You could shout your abortion, as they say. You could, you know, embrace it as something that was defining for you. Mm. Instead, I think what we've come to understand, especially in this age when we've seen declining birth rates, where we've seen, you know, the, the desperation of, you know, aging women in our society who uh, really want to have a kid and, and, you know, wish that they could wind the clock back and undo some of the decisions of the past. You know, I think that we've reached a point where people are really understanding that the value that is being discarded here is not something they can deny anymore. And, and from my perspective, this is a healthy development. It's something that's good about Amer the American people to recognize this along with the vast majority of nations around the world. You know, we are one of the very few nations uh, that continues a regime where abortion can be essentially accessed on demand up until birth. And that's something that I don't think we should have any pride in. We should yeah, view it as something Yeah, people don't realize that. that the vast majority of the world is more conservative on abortion than is the United States of America. It cuts against the grain the, of the, the vast majority videos. of the world will is, is Mississippi. It's, right. it's 15 weeks, you know, it's 12 weeks. And so when, when you look at that, I think you, you have to come to grips with the fact that like, we are the outliers here. We're up right. there with North Korea and China. And that's not a good thing. We shouldn't have no. any pride in that. No. We should view it as being something that is a, as a, dark mark on our uh, our approach to any kind of, of human ethic. And the, the funny thing is, you know, Will, that so many of the people that we wrestle with on the left started their careers as pro-life, you know, Catholic or religious members of the political community, including Joe Biden. When Joe Biden ran for the Senate in 1974, he ran and said, you know, in an interview with Washingtonian, you know, I'm one of the most socially conservative Democrats you will ever meet. And he said, you know, I 
uh, don't like this decision. I don't like Roe. I don't like the, the fact that we've, you know, suggested that there's no one involved except for the woman, you know, that there's not another person involved there. He said all those things. He opposed rolling back the Hyde Amendment. He voted for the partial birth abortion ban. He's someone who had a career that was very much in the center when it came to abortion politics. And yet, when it came time to run for the presidency in 2020, he was willing to cast all of that aside and to say, oh, no, uh, I'm for taxpayer-funded abortions now. And why is that? Because this is a religion for them. This is not an item that can have any kind of, of variance, any shift away from what the priorities of Planned Parenthood and the radical abortion lobby truly wants. And yeah. that is, I think, a true shame because we Co should be in an environment where Democrats are allowed to be pro-life. So a couple of thoughts. I think that's fascinating what you describe about the fact that we're sharing company with North Korea and China. That in and of itself should cause us to look around. And the idea that we are one of the few countries in the world that allow these liberal abortions is um, cutting against the grain of the videos you might see from, say, libs of TikTok or something like that, where women are inveighing, why does this country hate women so much? No, no. I mean, this country is out of step with the rest of the world in protecting the unborn. And so this is where I want to go with this. You, you made the argument, I think you began to make the argument today about uh, a parallel comparison analogy to slavery. And, um, and what, what I think is, is fascinating here is I, I brought up the Spartans, right? So what happens is, I think, over civilization, over time, as we become more civilized, we just gain more understanding. And this is something we've clearly gained more understanding on. Just because you can't see it doesn't make it real. And science is moving in the same direction as pro-life the absurdity of viability, the absurdity of an undue burden. Like these are terms that don't carry any meaning beyond science and science is backing this up. It's backing it up to the point of conception. And if you think about it that way, I do think it leads you down to the path where I think you are, which is within what, maybe 50 years, certainly a century, as science gets us there, we're gonna look back on this 50 year period and say, I mean, of all the things we wonder how history will judge us, this is the clearest one. They'll look back on us and say, Mm -hmm. How did they convince themselves this was okay? You know, I uh, I don't think I'm breaking uh, any confidence to share this with you, uh, but Jeff Goldberg, who is the uh, editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, uh, said to me a couple of years ago, you know, if there's one thing that I'm confident about that history will judge us for, it's uh, it's abortion. And he said that as someone who is, you know, a liberal who supports abortion, who, you know, is, is emphatically, I think, in favor of it. But he admitted to me that, that this is something that we will be judged for in the future about how we approached it. And I think deep down, if you got a lot of these Democrats uh, in, in a room in private and uh, maybe knocked a couple of bourbons into them, they would admit um, the, you know, not... That's not true of Elizabeth Warren. That's not true of the true radicals on this subject. Um, but, you know, deep down, I don't think Joe Biden feels good about this. I don't think that, you know, a lot of Democrats feel good about this. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema and, you know, a lot of Democrats who are kind of in the middle of the road, they know that this is not something that will be judged, you know, as appropriate by history. And why do we continue think... talking past each other, Ben? I mean, the truth is, yeah. of all the debates we have in the political sphere, this is the one where we're literally on separate pages. The right is talking about the sanctity of life, and the left is talking about a woman's right to choose. One talking about a woman's health choices, the other talking about infanticide. We're literally not arguing on the same page. Why? Well, I think a big part of that, um, unfortunately, is that We've had such a cultural uh, sort within the past couple of decades that we no longer have a strong presence of culturally conservative or traditionalists within the Democratic coalition. When Barack Obama talked about people who were clinging to their guns and their religion, um, he talked about that, people forget this, in the context of the 2008 primary. 
It was the Pennsylvania primary where he said that, um, you know, referring to, you know, union Catholic voters who were backing Hillary Clinton over him uh, with, you know, basically saying, you know, they need to hurry up and go away. And I think that that's been the attitude of the Democratic Party. It's unfortunate because if we had parties that were more uh, culturally attuned or balanced, where you could have some moderates within the Republican coalition, you could have some, you know, culturally conservative NASCAR Democrats and the like, uh, that would be a healthier polity for the country. Unfortunately, that's not where we are anymore. And so now we have this position where we're basically foreigners sharing a country together. And I think that that's something that's very bad in the long term. I hope that over the course of the coming generations, it can be fixed. But if it isn't, we're going to reach a point where the idea, the fanciful idea, the idea that I hate of a national divorce becomes more of a reality because we're so far apart on all of these subjects that are near and dear to our hearts. A national divorce is a pretty ominous, maybe, I'm not saying it is or is not, but maybe inevitable outcome. So I wanted to hit a couple of questions with you here as well. You're an astute political watcher, obviously. Um, so first, Ben, do you think this is going to have a massive implication on the midterms? For many, there is some thought out there. This is this is the godsend they've been waiting for. There isn't a single issue where they had a winning message. And now maybe they've got an arrow in their quiver. Uh, so I've, I've seen some of that analysis and I disagree with it. I just don't think that it's going to deliver that kind of thing because people tend to vote based on pocketbook issues uh, and their priorities, I think, are aligned to that. And that's where the Biden administration has totally failed them at the pump. Uh, in uh, energy costs, I'm I'm paying more to power my house, uh, just in terms of keeping the lights on, than I've ever paid before in my life. It's it's insane, uh, and uh, you know I think that this is something that's being felt by Americans across the country. I also think that most people who are on the left side of the abortion issue are already within the Democratic coalition. I don't think that they you know are new voters to be mm. added to that. And I think that the trend lines that we've seen from Hispanic voters when it comes to uh, schools, when it comes to education, when it comes to prioritizing parental rights and the like, those are all going to continue and they're not going to be affected negatively by any of this. Republicans who lean into the abortion issue are only going to find more Hispanic voters who agree with them than the opposite. So, no, I do not believe that this is going to be the kind of thing that, you know, gives uh, the Democrats an out. But I will say this, in my experience, uh, and, and I think this is borne out by, you know, the experience of the last couple of years, it's the people who lean away from culture war fights who end up losing. In other words, if they abandon the field to have it defined by their opponent, they're the ones who end up suffering for it. Uh, I saw that in Virginia when Ken Cuccinelli was running uh, back in 2000, and, and uh, I guess that would be 13. Um, and basically, you know, he allowed his opponent to define everything that he believed about the abortion subject and didn't really engage with it because he thought or he was advised by his advisors, you know, not to do so. I think that's a mistake. I think that Republicans should lean into the issue. They should have a message and they should be prepared to advocate for it. Um, but abandoning the field to the left is is just not a good idea. Well, if we've learned anything over the last four years, it is the value of playing offense. Own who you are, mm -hmm. own what you believe. And if you do not, then the other party will define you in lieu of you defining yourself. 100%. I think the only caveat or rebuttal I would offer to your midterm analysis would be does it turn out more voters? It may not convert more voters, but does it turn out more voters on the Democratic Party who don't traditionally show up for midterms? And I don't know whether or not that will happen or not. And really quick, a quick follow-up, Ben, because I actually, I actually want to hear the answer to this, and I just glossed over it. Young men are the most reliably pro-choice constituency, and the reason for that is why. Well, the reason for that is that it's a good way to, you know, uh, <laughs> to write off your mistakes, yeah. uh, your body, your choice, your baby, your problem. 
I mean, it's one of these situations that I think is is sadly uh, taken advantage of by uh, young men across the country yeah. time and again. It's and, the truth, though. It's a get out of jail free card truth. for young men. It's totally. It's that is absolutely how they use it. And look, you know, there's a there's a whole leftist thing that comes up all the time whenever abortion comes up, where you know someone will tweet out or post on, on, on some social media, you know, well, you know, do you think that men should be obligated to pay for, you know, women when it comes to their, you know, birth processes and, and, uh, take care of them when the child is in the womb and, and pay child support even after, you know, you, you don't believe that because you're, you know, essentially the, the implication is that, that, you know, we are some kind of, of, you know, masculine force that doesn't care about that. And my response to that is, oh no, I'm totally in favor of that. Let's do that. In fact, I know what you're talking let's, about. Yes, that, this, yes. this deal is, is totally fine from my perspective. In fact, I've let's seen make you tweet that, that before your terms are acceptable. You want to force men to pay? <laughs> your terms Absolutely are force them to pay. Grow up, be a man, take your responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Uh, please. Okay. I mean, I, Finally, I just think it would be a better country for it. I think you're right. Now, finally, let's end with this. So in an earlier conversation, Ben, that I had with Shannon Bream, I hadn't considered this. I want to get your observation on this. So I think there's a general presumption we're all operating under right now that the leaker of this draft opinion is probably somebody opposed to the opinion, somebody from the left, somebody perhaps clerking for one of the leftist jurists. Shannon said we have to keep every possibility open. It's an investigation, and we have no idea what or what could be driving this leak. And she did introduce the idea, what if, and it's just a possibility, what if it's somebody from the right? What if it's somebody in support of this opinion because they might be trying to preempt Chief Justice John Roberts from joining the opinion and watering it down? Is that hold any water in your estimation i know we're all dealing in the realm of speculation and there needs to be an investigation but do you think we should walk a little more carefully into who this leaker might be so shannon is an expert court reporter she's been following it you know closely for you know years she knows what she's talking about i disagree with her and the reason i disagree with her is because last night I had conversations both with a former clerk for Clarence Thomas, um, a, a chief staffer for Mitch McConnell, um, and uh, a chief staffer for former Attorney General Bill Barr, all about this, basically saying, you know, do you think this is a lefty or a righty? And they were emphatic, this is coming from the left. Um, and I do believe that. And I believe it because I think that this is a this is an attempt, a desperate attempt, to try to get some kind of public backlash that scares people off of this decision, uh, because this decision is, you know, essentially 90% of what I would write. I mean, I'm an Alito guy. I love Alito. So, so you know, I, I'm reading this opinion. I was just, yes, yes, you know, over and over again. But what I would just say is I do not think there is a situation where this is a leak that is coming from the right. Um, it just doesn't stand up. And one of the big reasons for that is think about the consequences when the name comes out. Mm -hmm. When the name comes out, if you are a creature of the left, you are getting six-figure, seven-figure book deal kind of treatment. You are going on the speaking tours as the last you know, resistance to some kind of terrible right-wing fascist act, etc. If you are a leaker from the right, there's no such benefit for you in terms of your professional career. There's nothing mm -hmm. that really comes out of this for you that's a positive. And so for that reason, among others, I would just say, I think confidently this is coming from the left. It's probably a Sotomayor staffer because Kagan would never, Kagan's too much of an institutionalist to, to want anything like this to happen, but we'll see, we will find out. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, I think this is terrible because it's one of those things where, you know, the, the court was one of the last institutions that had not been degraded to the point of others uh, yeah. when it came to people's trust. If something like this can happen on a decision of this level of import. 
it is a really disturbing thing. And frankly, it gives the fact that it happened gives a lot of moderates who might not like the ultimate result of the decision and out people like Susan Collins, you know, they may not agree with the decision, but they don't like this way that this was leaked and they're going to lean into that. So, you know, look, we'll, we'll see what comes out at the end of the day, but I'm pretty confident that this is coming from the left, not the right. Yeah. And I would add to that, that if the five justices do not like John Roberts, concurrence they can push him off to do his own while they write the majority opinion in the words of totally. Samuel Alito. They don't need the leverage. I would also add which side of the aisle is marshalling mob justice to exert leverage right now? Which one is using that as a tool? And I think you'll come to the answer more clearly that this is a tool of the left. Um yeah, and I think uh I think you're right. It it threatens one of the pillars of our republic. Yet another pillar of our republic, the implications of which will be playing out. Unfortunately, I don't even have to say decades. It's probably going to play out in the next yeah. two, three years in some pretty dramatic fashions. Um, listen, I love talking to you. Uh, make you a deal. Let's do it more often. I'd love to have you on. I would. I would love to. I would love to. Will, uh, uh, you know, how do you feel about the the uh, uh, former Redskins taking Sam Howell? <laughs> I'm not um I know you're a Commanders fan. Um I'm not that concerned. I'm Don't not that concerned that. about Sam Howe, but I'll tell you what cuz I know you love the Cowboys as well or at least you love to hate them. As soon as your interview ends Ben, I'm going to have a Cowboys expert break down their draft coming up <laughs> in just a moment here on the Will Kane podcast. So stick awesome. around, would you Ben? <laughs> <laughs>